Well, let me divide this up into three areas. First of all, these, these crowded hearts are a divided heart. A weedy soil, and, and you notice what Jesus says in verse 18, these are ones sown among thorns. There is something already present in the heart when the word of God comes. And so it's immediately crowded. The heart is divided. Now, did Jesus ever talk about that? Yes. By the way, he tells this story in all three Gospels. Let's look back in the book of Matthew because he tells us something interesting. If you turn back to Matthew 13, that's the story that we're looking at, the uh, parable of the sower. Matthew 13. And the, the, the first nine verses are about that sower and the seed. But as you turn to Matthew 13, Jesus has already said something about the heart that's crowded, that's divided, that, that has uh, uh, no room for God. And, and if you're in 13, back up to chapter 6 of Matthew. That's where I want to actually take you. But I wanted you to see the reference point of Matthew 13. But turn to Matthew 6 in verse 24. Because weedy soil, this thorny soil, represents a heart preoccupied with worldly things. Preoccupied, under the occupation of worldly things. And in Matthew 6, in verse 24, Jesus says this to that heart. He says, no one can serve two masters. Now, this is an absolute statement. He says, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. Now, by the way, do you remember the rich young ruler? It says that he... He turned from Christ. You know what that means? That means that, that he, he utterly was repulsed when Jesus told him that. that. That word turned is so, you know, it says he went away, actually it says in English, went away sorrowful. Actually the word was not that gentle went away. I mean, th- there's a, a sense to this that, that Jesus is saying. Look in verse 24. He says, he will be loyal to the one and despise, be repulsed by, be totally turned away from the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, mammon is just a a, a general term for the whole cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the pursuit of things. It's the world system. It's the God of this world. It's, it's, It's living for here and now rather than for him and then. It's, it's not living for the eternal and the spiritual. It's living for the physical and the temporal and the... The pleasures of the moment. So the weedy soil represents this heart preoccupied with mammon, with the world. And the thorn bushes are not visible because, like I said, they've been burned off from the surface of this heart that Jesus is talking about the word coming to. But their roots are still intact. And when the seed gets sown and watered and germinated, the entrenched thorns, which are already there, that are native, that are, that are hardy and are thriving, they grow faster, and they just take the life right out of that seed and right out of that heart. They choke the grain before it produces any fruit. This is a divided heart. This is a heart that has divided loyalties, and those loyalties are never reconcilable. You cannot merge those two loyalties. Jesus said, look at verse 24, no one can have... Two masters. You cannot bow two directions. You have to bow one direction or the other. You can't bow in two directions to two masters. And he says, this heart has divided loyalties. This heart has the thorn and the seed. No one can serve both, he says, because you'll either love the one and hate the other or... You'll be loyal to the one, despise the other. Keep turning to chapter 7 of Matthew's Gospel. It's just the next page in my Bible. Jesus talks about this uh, in another continuation of this sermon. By the way, all of Jesus' uh, Sermon on the Mount keeps talking about the two, 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 two. Uh, He talks about two ways, uh, two treasuries, two masters, two eyes. Everything in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he's always talking uh, uh, in kind of like both poles. And so in chapter 7, look what he says in verse 21. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will, the one who bows to the master, as 624 is talking about, the one who yields to him, does the will, what? Of my Father in heaven. Many will say, Lord, Lord, haven't we prophesied and done wonders? 
Verse 23, and I'll say to them, I never knew you, depart from me. Look at this, you who practice bowing to the other master. You who's, now remember what Jesus is talking about. The whole context of 721 to 23 is the end of the life. The whole context is that the crop is in. That the harvest is past. And that the harvest of this life, if you notice in verse 21, was not doing the will of the Father in heaven. Verse 23, it was practicing lawlessness. It was thorns. Not doing the will of my Father in heaven and practicing righteousness. Remember what I said at the beginning? Jesus compared life to a field, people to soil, the gospel to seed, and eternal life to a crop of harvested righteousness. Now some are 30-fold. Some are double that. They're 60-fold. Some are more than triple that. They're 100-fold. But those crops are the harvest of the life. And Jesus is warning that you can tell along the way where you're headed by where you're bowing and what you're doing. So the crowded heart is a divided heart. Let me take you to one more thing at the end of the Bible. Look at 1 John. So go all the way to the other end, just before Revelation. Back up those little tiny books that are kind of just before Revelation. Uh, The end of your Bible is Revelation. Back up to 1 John chapter 2. Because this is what Jesus is referring to that John is is testifying to in 1 John 2.15. And this is speaking to the thorny heart because the, the cares of this world is what we're looking at, this divided heart that has got two loyalties. Do not love the world, 1 John 2.15, or the things in the world. That's the end of Jesus' three weeds. Remember he said the first is the cares of the world and the last is the desire for things. That's what chokes out the word. Well, John combines them both. He says, don't love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, look at what a sobering statement. The love of the Father is not in him. You know what the whole book of 1 John is about? How you know you're a believer. And the whole book of 1 John says this, by this we know. The love of God. Because his love is shed abroad in our hearts. And we have love for one another. Beloved, let us love one another because love comes from God. And everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. Look at this. If you love the world, the love of the Father, the love that makes you born of God, the love that gives you eternal life, is not in him. Do you hear Christ's parable? It's not in It never finds root. It never bears fruit. And the fruit is that there is this love for God. Now you say, wait a minute, is it perfect all the time? Well, I'm glad you asked that. You're in 1 John. Go to the book of Jude. I want to show you something. Um, Book of Jude, and it only has one chapter. And I want to start with you in verse 20 of the book of Jude. Because believers struggle with sin. When you get saved, you are not eradicated. Now, that, that is a doctrine uh, of a denomination. They believe in the eradication of the old nature. But what's amazing is I've never seen an eradicated person because the ones that are eradicated are proud about it. And I say, you know, I've met I've, at conferences, I've met speakers from that denomination that they have been eradicated. That means their sin nature is gone. And they tell me about it. They say, I'm... I no longer sin. I say, really? Yes. And you know, they are right then. They're very proud about their eradication. In fact, one of them, after he told me that, pulled out his pocket mirror. Now, for a man to carry a pocket mirror, you know, I don't have that problem. Boy, did he have that problem. He actually, to get, before he spoke, he pulled out his pocket mirror and was checking to make sure his... Beautiful hair was waving. He popped it back in his pocket. And I thought, you're eradicated? There's still a root of pride there. And you know, so we still struggle with sin. All of us. I do, you do. We do. All the believers. Paul's testimony is Romans 7. But look what Jude, verse 20 says. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in this love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Now look at this, verse 22. 
and on some have compassion, making a distinction. Others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments defiled by the flesh. There are believers who struggle deeply with sin. And there is a ministry we're to have in the church of rescuing them. This I remember when I pastored in New England, uh, one of my ministries was we had this, this Jude uh, 22 ministry. And that was ministering to these who, because of the huge homosexual community that's up in New England, that, that they had come to Christ. But just as much as, as uh, you, if you're given to things, still look at those catalogs and wish you have those things. And just as much as you, if you formerly were into alcohol, you have to say, I'm not going to go back to that. And just as you, if you formerly were into any other sin, you still have temptations. They still were tempted back to their old lifestyle. They hated it, and they were new creations in Christ, but they were drawn back to that. And you know, we used to have this Jude 22, of some have compassion, Jude 23, others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. We used to call them. We used to say, come to our house. Come and visit us. Come and, and come to the church. Come to the haven. When you are tempted, when you are come. And I remember we had one man who, who was so, and he was a leader of this ministry. He would go right to them, uh, wherever they were, in the bar or whatever, and he would just take them and he'd say, come on, you need to get out of here. I mean, he literally took verse 23, snatching them out of the fire. Because sometimes we think when someone gets saved that they are just perfect for the rest of their life. No, some Jude said, have compassion on them. They are weak and they are struggling. Okay, so these divided hearts that Jesus is talking about, and go with me back to Mark chapter 4 because I want you to keep this orientation. He's talking about not someone that, that has had a change within and they're still struggling with sin. He's talking about someone that's had no change and the, the gospel is getting crowded out. And these people that, that have the thorny life are uncommitted. They're preoccupied with the world's pleasure. They live live for money, they live for their career, they live for fame and fortune. They say they're Christians, but they don't care. You know what one of the greatest testimonies of the assurance of your salvation is? If you struggle with sin. If you struggle with sin, if, if you wrestle with it, if you're like the Apostle Paul, you can say, what I would do, I don't do, and what I would not do, that I do. That's an evidence of salvation because the the unregenerate person doesn't even know what sin is. They just don't want to get in trouble too badly. They don't want anybody to know. They hope no one finds out. But they don't have that internal conviction, that, that hatred for sin, which is a mark of salvation. And that's what this thorny, weedy heart. It shows no evidence that the seed was ever sown. 